Ambassador Manta, thank you for taking your time for this. And uh, we still have one, two minutes, so we're waiting for Salman to join. But I, a lot of people from Pakistan, you know, of course, they fondly remember you and they were giving their regards to you. And um, also my, 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 my colleague, who's my partner, brother-in-law, in his office, there's a, um, a VIPO certificate, which is signed by you. I think you... Ah. Okay, well, that's very kind. And thank you very much. I, I look forward to seeing them. You know, I, I still come to Pakistan fairly frequently. Uh, because I have uh, some business advising and also I work on the board of the Habib University in Karachi. So uh, I, uh, I, I try to keep I try to keep in touch. Yeah. Well, I'm very glad to hear about that and especially your involvement with Habib University. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a very good university. Um, great institution, yeah. So anyway, thank you and look forward to our discussion. It's my pleasure, and um, Dr. Silman has also joined us, um, so um, I think we can kick off now. Um, no, I'm delighted that you and Dr. Silman have joined this panel because um, uh, although the topic is very grim and the situation um, sitting here in London seems very tragic, um, uh, but there is a lot of confusion um, as well, uh, especially in Pakistan. And I suppose the source of the confusion is also um, the, the, the trip of our prime minister and the cabinet to Russia, uh, because I think till that time, I mean, Pakistan really didn't have much relationship or hasn't had much relationship with Russia in the past. So it's kind of like an unknown um, um, entity um, especially for a lot of us in the financial markets and especially people who have you know, grown up post uh, um, uh, the Cold War and post the Afghan War. So um, would love to hear from you that, you know, why is the world reacting so strongly on uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Um, and because what we have seen, and then I invited you over the weekend, but what we have seen is that there has been almost a, co a, a coordinated and, you know, a global uh, response against it, which I suppose nobody expected, or perhaps Russia didn't expect. So we'd love to hear first, firstly from you, um, Ambassador Manta, that why is this such a big thing? Well, let me, let me go over a few points and thank you once again for this opportunity and, and greetings to the colleagues who are taking part. Um, it should not be a surprise that there is this coordinated activity. Um, what this particular administration in Washington has in common is that it is very much cons concerned about rebuilding its alliances. This is a result of the damage that was done by President Trump. So even though this particular event has put that in fast forward, it's made it move forward, this rebuilding of alliances was something they were working on. And when I say alliances, I don't mean just NATO. I mean also Japan, Korea, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Australians. Now, what's very interesting about the world response, you see it saw the vote in the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, you know, there are not many people who are supportive of what Russia has done. And I think it's just because Russia has made an, an enormous miscalculation here. Uh, there's the only way to explain this is that people like uh, President Putin and people around him truly believed this idea that uh, this would be an easy war. I think they may have been affected by what they saw or interpreted from the experience of the Americans in Afghanistan, that basically the Taliban would be like the Russians and uh, Zelensky would be like Ashraf Ghani. Everything would collapse and boom, that would be gone. So they made a big mistake and now he's very stuck. He's taking heavy, heavy casualties and there's no really easy way out. So the first point I'll make, it's very early days. Militarily, we really don't know what's going to happen. It's possible that we could see uh, uh, Putin destroying Kiev the way he destroyed Grozny in Chechnya uh, or Aleppo in Syria. And uh, this will take, this will be a huge humanitarian catastrophe. That's one thing. Secondly, many people are trying to figure out what's going on in Putin's head. No one knows except Putin. This is a very, very difficult kind of game to play. So, there, and then there, as I mentioned, there's been the surprise military issues. As far as Pakistan is concerned, it did surprise quite a few people that Imran Khan chose the day after the invasion to visit Moscow. But I think it's fair to say this was a long planned trip and it was just, in, in my opinion, bad timing. Uh, it's anyone's guess whether it was wise to keep going. But I think in Imran's mind, and I don't want to play that I know Imran's mind any better than I know Putin's mind, uh, I think he was looking at an agenda 
you know, that includes things like defense, uh, getting support for the NSG and FATF, uh, working on energy pipelines, uh, economic things, importation of wheat, this kind of thing. So I think what he was looking at was not so much making a statement about Russia's invasion, but looking at long-term possibilities with Russia. Part of this is driven, I think, by hurt feelings, hurt feelings that the Americans don't call him up. And I think, in my personal opinion, uh, it's not wise to have policy based on hurt feelings. You should look a little deeper. But that's my own opinion. He may feel that it's a clever move to try to balance the Americans with the Russians. Now, great pain is coming to Russia with the sanctions. And this is my fourth and final point. We should look at this long term. And for those of you who are doing investing, you should think very, very hard about what the impact of these economic sanctions are going to be. Russia is going to be really, in, in, in a global sense, brought to its knees. It is not going to be able to buy and sell uh, in, in, the, in international markets. Sure, it, if you want to uh, trade with Russia using, using Chinese currency, you can. But most of the modern world of finance is going to be unavailable to the Russians. So there is going to be an enormous problem. Uh, Russia has a huge capacity to absorb punishment. Russian people are very tough. But this is, believe me, going to be very tough. And it's going to be tough on other people, too. I think we're going to see an extraordinary burst of inflation. I think that people who eat wheat, and that's everybody in Pakistan, are going to see wheat get a lot more expensive. 40% of the world's export of wheat comes from Russia and Ukraine. 80% of the world's exports in sunflower oil come from Ukraine. And so you're talking about not only the pre-existing issues that had to do with supply chain and other problems that led uh, COVID that had led to inflation, but we have now shortage issues and, and kind of acceleration of those kinds of issues that are going to have an impact, I think, around the world. So when I say the Russians will suffer, they will, especially middle class Russians living in Petersburg and Moscow. But all of us around the world are going to feel this. These, these are not easy, easy sanctions. And so what's very hard, since we're in the early days of this fight, we don't know how it's going to work out, whether there's a solution. Um, the impact is going to be very, very long term and very lasting. Many people have said, we have come now to the end of the post-Cold War era. And now we are in the post-Cold post War era, for whatever that's worth. I think economically, we just don't know how that's going to turn out. And I look uh, to uh, Mr. Salman Ahmed maybe to, to help us understand that better, because I think economically over time, we think geostrategically now, but economically over time, that's where the big impact will be. Thank you for that, Ambassador Mantra. That's much more um, grimmer than what I thought, but very, very comprehensive and makes um, a lot of sense. And then I, I thought that perhaps this would be a short duration problem, but you're saying that this, this is a, a, a this is a much longer um, issue. Um, does it lead to a bipolar world? Because it, it's sitting in Pakistan, because you know, it's, it does seem that you know, China is rising and Russia might be forming a block with China. So, and so, so Pakistan is saying that, you know, okay, if, if they have hurt feeling from the US, then there's another block with, like it used to exist in the uh, Cold War era. Um, so will it be, do you think the new world which is forming, will the role of Russia be that of uh, the old Russia of the, of the Cold World War, or will it be more like Venezuela or North Korea or Iran? Very hard to say, but I do, I do think that you, you need to be careful with the idea of bipolar versus multipolar. These mean so many things to so many people that it gets confusing when you talk about this. Take the example of India. India has chosen not to vote against Russia. That is, India and Pakistan are totally aligned uh, in, in the world in the judgment on this. Pretty unusual, right? Both India and Pakistan, for very different reasons, seem to be interested in making sure they understand that if there is a change in polarity and a change in power, you don't want to be, they don't want to be caught on the losing side. So I think that part of what I see with Imran Khan's visit is 
just hedging your bets, just waiting, making sure you don't end up on the wrong side here. The difficulty is if you look at the longer term impact of, for example, the Russian Chinese agreement signed during the Beijing Olympics, just uh, say 10 days ago, it is quite advantageous to the Chinese. The Russians wanted that agreement because they wanted China before this invasion to uh, basically give their okay to criticize NATO, to do these kinds of things. But in exchange, China is going to be the buffer for Russia, that is to buy its energy, to build pipelines, to buy its foodstuffs. So what Russia is entering into is what I would call a vassal relationship with China. Russia wants to be a global player. Russia, by doing what it's doing and by, get, and by provoking this sanctions regime, in my opinion, Russia is deciding it's going to be the junior player, the, the weaker player in its relationship with China. China is the big winner here. Because the Chinese, if you really think about it, and I will give you my own, my own interpretation, the, the Chinese are very confident. The Chinese are confident that over time they are getting stronger and, the, and the, the West is getting weaker. Now you can say they are right or they're wrong, but many of them, many of the leaders I've met believe that. And they say, we have time, time is on our side. Psychologically, that's not the way the Russian leadership looks at it. They are actually quite anxious. Putin is anxious to leave a legacy of reuniting the Russian empire. Putin is very anxious to make change now. If I don't make change now, I'll never be able to make it. His is a, a kind of an, a, a feeling of fear of the future. And so the Chinese don't have to worry. They feel they don't have to worry. And they can accept a lot of change over the next 10, 20, 30 years. The Russians don't feel that. At least their leadership doesn't talk that way. So you have a very strange polarity here where if there's going to be a Russian-Chinese bloc, it seems to me that events of the last week have made Russia much weaker, China much more strong. Then you have people like India who want to be, you know, they're, they're uh, against, they're not voting against Russia, but partly because they want to keep their options open to be a bloc player too. So everyone's trying to maneuver India and Pakistan, ironically, very similarly. They want to maneuver and not, not sure they get caught on the losing side, and no one knows who the losing side is going to be. Mm, well, thank you, thank you for that and it's a complicated situation. Um, and I'll squeeze in one more question before I jump to Salman um, Ahmed for views on how the global market's taking it. Um, what do you think is the end game? I, I do get the sense from the commentary I've been hearing that it seems as if you know there's not broadband-based support for the invasion in Russia as well. As in it, people say that it's Putin's war, it's not Russia's war. And there are demonstrations, in, like for example, in St. Petersburg. So what's the end game? Is the end game a full uh, takeover of Ukraine in, in, on one extreme case? And the other extreme case, is it the fall of Putin's government? Like, where will it settle? Yeah, the answer is yes. Exactly as you say, there are these extremes and we are, we are at the very beginning of the crisis. And so the factors are, first, what kind of war will we see? If this is a war that destroys the cities of Ukraine, it is not likely that Putin unites them. See, Putin has written a paper, as you may know, that there is no such thing as a, a Ukraine, a Ukraine, there's no such thing as a Ukrainian people, they are just Russian people. And he may believe this. He may believe that everyone would just say they would greet the soldiers with flowers and be liberated from, he calls the Nazis and drug addicts who run Ukraine. Well, he was wrong about this. He is going to come in and if he destroys that country and if the West continues to supply the insurgency, he is going to be in for a very difficult debilitating war that's going to last a lot of time and take a lot of money and a lot of blood. So that's one alternative. We have basically the destruction of Ukraine, but you have an insurgency that goes on and on, and that's what he does. And he will have to crack down at home against dissent on that. Another opportunity is he doesn't win the war. That is, he can't win, he can't lose, he's stuck. And he has domestic people fighting against him at home. 
there is the possibility that the oligarchs and the generals and the people who are around him say, okay, enough, Vladimir, you, you screwed this up, you're gone. That's not likely. Some people think it might happen, but that's the other extreme that he could, there could be regime change, but not in Ukraine, regime change in Russia. Between those two poles, the absolute destruction of Ukraine and a change of government in Russia, there are any number of things in between. Can there be a deal? Can there be a diplomatic deal? People are talking about it and trying to come up with one to save lives. Can there be a change based on the uh, sanctions that means that the whole background, while we're arguing about a war, the whole background in the world is changing. And this again is what I hope that uh, Salman Ahmed can tell us about. Is this a game changer or not for a lot of other things in the world? We don't know that. So my answer is not very satisfying one, which is there is a broad, there is a broad uh, menu of outcomes that go from destruction of Ukraine to the fall of Putin. And we don't have any idea which of these might happen, but it's very early. This is something that's gonna go on for weeks and months. Well, thank you for that, um, Ambassador Mantar, and we'll come back to you with questions. Uh, but uh, now I'll, I'll, I'll jump to Dr. Salman Ahmed, um, who's the head of global macro investing at Fidelity. And he has been quite prophetic in, our, in his um, um, uh, analysis and forecasts, especially on oil prices and global markets over the last few years when I've been, I've been following him. Um, Dr. Salman, um, what's your take on what's all of that, what's going on, especially oil prices at 114? It's quite difficult for Pakistan, countries like Pakistan. Um, and especially if, as Dr. Ambassador Munter says, that this is going to continue for weeks and months, then that means uh, oil prices can sustain at that level. And he's talk, also talking about inflation and other commodities. So we'd love to get your um, take on this. I'm usually you're br brilliant at this, so I, I, I open the floor for you. Oh, thank you very much, Ali, for the kind introduction, and thank you very much, Ambassador Munter, for your very insightful comments. Um, let me share a little bit of a framework to to map out these thinking. Uh, so let's focus on the economic and the financial vertical of this uh, this conflict. And then also there is now a timeline dimension we have to think about. So what happens over the next six months to three to five years and then 10 years plus? Because I think all these three time dimensions get affected quite significantly and, and obviously a lot of uncertainty in terms of how it pans out in the near term. But I think all of us can agree that a significant shift has happened in terms of the mindset. And you can see that, for example, the German response to defense spending. So, you know, these are once in a generation shifts, which uh, which have happened overnight. So I think it takes time for people to even absorb that how much big shifts uh, in, in, in policy making and thinking is taking place. So let's start with the global uh, economic and financial uh, uh, vertical and implication of this war. So let's start with Russia. So is Russia a financially systemic country? It is not. Um, it, it's going to be a sizable uh, write down risk to the global financial system, but according to our numbers, it's it's quite tolerable. Uh, so even if the entire Russia's uh, financial liabilities are written down to zero, so please remember that Russia is a net creditor to the world, so it has more external assets than external liabilities. The external assets have been frozen in some shape or form by the global Western system, around 75% of it. So anything which is about, it's in gold or Chinese assets is unfrozen. The rest is technically, for technical perspective, perspective it's, it's frozen, right? So on the liability side, which is around 1 trillion, which is the foreign foreigners claim on Russia, uh, that's now going through a proper write down to zero. So we saw the index providers today announcing that Russia will be kicked out of MSCI indices at zero price. So, so that's the write down risk the system will have to take. Some, some of the banks, especially in Europe, will have to take that risk on their capital balance sheets. But again, looking at the numbers, we have dealt with multiple higher, bigger problems than this. Just to put things in perspective, it's three months of QE from the US. <laughs> that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. So it's not a systemically important issue. Although, Effort-wise, it will be very problematic, and we've already seen news flow from FT. What kind of ramifications uh, may come through if uh, you know uh, all uh, uh, foreign investment exposures to Russia are are, are 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 priced at zero? 
So, so that will probably go through in the next few days. Um, the, for us, the more important uh, channel is the commodity linkages. So this geopolitical uh, conflict is coming at a time when Europe is heavily dependent on Russian energy supplies. So just to give you a number sense, 40% of European energy supply comes from Russia, around, sorry, nat gas comes from Russia, uh, and then 25% of oil is provided by Russia. So Russia is a beast in energy markets. Uh, and it's not gonna be easy to sort of replace them if you have physical commodity um, disruptions, which by the way, have started taking place, despite the fact that sanctions have carved out energy, but the unintended consequences is that the private sector is self-sanctioning. Uh, so so you, you've got many news flow from cargo companies refusing uh, to work with Russia. So if you don't have cargo freight, how are you gonna move energy <laughs> if you see my point, uh, even if you're allowed to do it? So there's a lot of self-sanctioning which is starting to disrupt uh, commodity flow, especially in oil. Uh, on gas, the gas is still running. Uh, and that's where there's a high likelihood in the near term that that becomes a geopolitical tool as well. Uh, and, and, and I think it's a question for, 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 for everybody to answer is that why wouldn't Russia do it <laughs> now that their economic and financial se sector has been collapsed? Uh, and, and I think we are seeing that, uh, you know, uh, that heartbeat falling, you know, the, the shock value is there and uh, bank runs have started. So if, if it's, 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 it's a near certainty that their financial system will collapse, uh, and, and of course, the economic implications will be then felt from now on, and, and it will only strengthen. The question is, uh, is that, you know, this gas supply, which is going on, uh, uh, what's the purpose of it if you can't get paid for it? Uh, so, uh, so that's something we are, have to think about it from a macro perspective. Uh, Europe uh, uh, integration with Russian gas infrastructure is not uniform, so uh, Germany, Italy, for example, are much more uh, exposed in the bigger countries, Hungary, Poland. It's a matter of geography. Please remember when we are looking at nat gas infrastructure, it is a very geographical issue. So the further you are from Russia, the less dependent you are on Russian gas line, uh, gas pipelines. So it's back to basically 20th century in many ways. This is not about digital cyber <laughs> and, and apps. This is about basic commodities. Uh, uh, how are you going to keep the lights running and how are you going to, as I think uh, Ambassador Manta said, food prices, shocks, which I've, by the way, already started because Ukraine is shut off now. So Ukraine is not exporting anymore. And Ukraine is a big part uh, of grains market. So that shock in physical terms is already in the pipeline. Now, the, obviously, the big shock we are concerned about is, is what happens with nat gas disruptions. So our assessment is if nat gas is disrupted, uh, then there is a near certainty we get a recession in Europe. Uh, and stagflation uh, globally. Um, and, and the template uh, we are using is the 1973 oil embargo, uh, where um, you had a similar disruption in terms of daily supply, uh, which lasted for seven months. Uh, uh, oil uh, 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 more than doubled uh, uh, during that period. Uh, and you had effects on equity markets, uh, significant recession, uh, especially in the DM world. Uh, so, so all in all, um, so that's our starting to become our base case. Now there are other scenarios in terms of how obviously the things pan out on the ground. It's clear that the military campaign has been intensified as, as Ambassador Mantel was mentioning. Uh, but then there is of course the tail risk of regime change, for example, in Russia. I don't know how much to put probability on it. You know, we, we have no edge, as, as Ambassador Mantel mentioned, on, on that kind of analysis. But the base case is that disruptions have started uh, and they are likely to uh, uh, increase uh, going forward. Having said that, the macro damage will take time to appear. So if you look at the 73 playbook, uh, it took one year for the macro damage to the rest of the world to become visible in data. So it doesn't happen immediately. It takes time for a commodity shock to play out. Uh, uh, so, so that's something to keep in mind. So in terms of implications for countries like Pakistan, if you are importer of basic commodities, this is a massive terms of trade, negative trade or trade shock. Uh, it also should highlight the importance of having baseline strength in the economy to take shocks. So a weak economy uh, in uh, facing a severe external shock 
uh, is basically going to have to pay the price of of that structural weakness in your system. Uh, so so that's something hopefully from a longer term perspective shows some thinking to to countries like Pakistan to have a longer horizon these things rather than just thinking about the next day and the next five days. Um, uh, so that and these are obviously significant moves. So those are the short term, near term implications. Were probably from a from a six to twelve month perspective. And let's talk about the three year perspective. Uh, there's quite a few things happening now. Of course, the energy uh, policy moves in Europe are profound. Uh, we are expecting that nuclear will be back in Germany. Coal plants are being ramped up already. Um, so uh, that is a short term solutions, but really. The medium-term shift towards renewables should escalate. Uh, medium-term diversification of energy supplies should escalate, uh, and also self-dependency should ex escalate. Uh, that you're not reliant in an interdependent world, which is basically uh, can switch off anytime, <laughs> as 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 a private sector, you know, entities uh, are going going down to the household sector. You are recipient of these these events where you have no control over, but your supply chains are obviously uh, are linked with that. So COVID already had created that, that risk management mindset in inventories. I think this will only escalate it further. Uh, and especially uh, uh, where your supply chains are originating are, is as important as its price now. Uh, this is not a pure economic argument because pure economic argument is that you should look at price and efficiency. No, it depends on where you're getting the supply. <laughs> even if you have to pay a higher price for it. So it is inflationary from a medium term perspective as well. So it creates friction in the system. Now, from a longer term perspective, I think it's probably too early to, to start projecting. We will obviously near term developments will make a, a big, uh, uh, will, be, will be important. But I think there are two trends uh, we should be careful about, which is uh, the weaponization of economics and financial system comes at a cost long term. People will create alternative systems because you always have to now create a probability that you can be switched off overnight uh, from, uh, from a system. Um, so that's a risk management mindset for different countries. I think it's a different, uh, a different pros and cons, cons analysis to be done. Please remember that Russia was de-dollarizing quite rapidly since 2014. Their reserve composition is very different to compare to what it was in 2014. Uh, and a lot of uh, EM focused colleagues of ours who are much more proficient than, at it than I am uh, have been highlighting that dollar shares have been going down. Uh, uh, so yuan was not a, 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 a didn't didn't play a part in U uh, Russian reserves a few years ago, but it is it's now around 14, 15 percent. Gold holdings were increased quite significantly, but the scope and the depth of these sanctions, especially in the central bank, are so severe that doesn't really matter how much de-dollarization you did because. The rest of the world, this is not just US sanctions, please remember, these are EU, US, and everybody combined, which has multiplied the, uh, the, uh, the shock for, uh, for, for Russia. So, so uh, it, it does uh, create some long-term question marks around, around interconnectivity with the global financial system as it stands right now, uh, and, 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 and how the shock can be transmitted overnight uh, if your financial system is switched off. Uh, but as I said, I think it has different assessment for different countries, depending on uh, uh, how you see yourself in the geopolitical map. Uh, so that's something to think about. Uh, from a lo again, longer perspective, we do think it increases focus on renewables. Uh, Counterintuitively, it also increases focus on less reliance on fossil fuels because oil prices going up is like a carbon tax. Uh, you know, it's making oil very expensive and you have to think about switching from off from oil permanently, especially when you, uh, when you are, especially when this commodity has become geopolitically sensitive. Uh, so it counterintuitively does increase your uh, focus on renewables and self-sufficiency because renewables you can generate in your own country. Remember, you can put your own wind farm and you can put your own solar supply. Uh, so you don't have to have solar supply, uh, solar coming from, from Russia, for example, to your country. You can put it in your own country, right? Obviously, there are some geographical elements there. There are some optimal uh, areas where you can put your uh, solar and so on and so forth. Be beyond that, it is not like fossils, where the fossil supply is somewhere else and the demand is happening somewhere, uh, uh, some, somewhere else. So it's back, back to basics in some ways of how the basic commodity uh, interlinkages work. Uh, and, and in fact, a serious 
uh, reckoning to be done for countries who import a lot of commodities, including Pakistan. Uh, because uh, uh, because this, uh, as, as Ambassador Mantha said, if, if this shock continues and transmits, which is likely to be the base case, because we don't know where is the out right now. How does it go back to pre-Thursday, <laughs> right? I mean, it, there's no uh, there's no path back uh, to 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 pre-invasion uh, right now, uh, uh, unless 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 until there's a potential regime change, but we don't know how likelihood that is how that works so so in that way i think this this is a serious shock uh and we need to think about stagflation uh and we need to i think as i mentioned earlier uh think about the 1973 playbook uh which was uh very similar in terms of supply disruption and lasted six seven months uh uh, uh in terms of uh, uh shutting off of supply from uh, from the global uh, global system so all in all um Stagflation is our base case view, especially for the U.S., Europe. Uh, the recession risks have increased quite sharply uh, uh, because this is not a one-way harm game. The commodity interdependence is quite significant. Uh, and not all natural gas can be replaced. I can go on and on, but there are some very specific points you have to think about. Natural gas infrastructure is way less flexible than oil. Oil, you can move around in tankers. Natural gas is dependent on your pipeline network, uh, and, and natural gas plays a big role in countries like Germany, which are very industrial uh, sector heavy. Uh, so you will have to switch off the industrial sector. Uh, household sectors can still be protected. So, so, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a significant risk in, in disruption. So in terms of market pricing, that's why the commodity markets are very stressed right now. Um, because A, there is some signs of disruption already, and of course the risk premium that this potential disruption can happen soon is also rising. I think the macro damage happens over time. Uh, this is not a financial shock that the, uh, that the markets immediately absorb it uh, like a liquidity crunch because Russia is not that big enough to, to create that in our view, apart from some one or two random hedge fund blowing up uh, because they didn't do their risk management properly. But, uh, 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 but in terms of uh, the macro shock, I think the, the cost will for the for the developed economy and the emerging economies ex Russia will only pile up going forward in a more slower moving manner, but certainly it's a regime shift. Uh, so that's a base case, but of course there are certain scenarios, multiple scenarios here uh, in terms of uh, you know one. Uh, I'll leave with one point in terms of uh, of maybe there's a point of view which is coming being raised that maybe these sanctions are too aggressive and some of them will be rolled back. The only point I would mention is that the private sector will not buy this. Uh, they will interpret the maximum sanction uh, because uh, you, uh, you have reputational risk, but also the fact that policymakers change their mind. Uh, so, so you have to have risk aversion in that one. Uh, so, so permanent damage has been done and we have crossed the Rubicon. It's not like we can go back to where things were uh, pre-invasion, uh, especially on the commodity markets, interdependency, and some of the longer-term implications I mentioned, uh, which are starting to take shape. In fact, as I said, energy policy in Europe is already changing overnight uh, 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 as a result of this uh, uh, these uh, these developments. So I'll pause here. Uh, and, and, thank and thank you for that. And it seems as if um, that, as you said, that it's it's almost seems like the first part of the domino which has fallen and there will be reactionary reaction to this uh, domino which has fallen and um, and as you said that perhaps it seems that the market has perhaps not fully priced that in because we don't know how the impact will be and it could be short term medium term as well as long term structural changes i have two questions for dr salman and one for uh, ambassador manta but i think ambassador manta you have want to have a comment. Can I make a, just a quick comment, uh, two things Please. about what, what uh, the economic assessment, which I very much appreciate and very much agree with. First is one of the things that often happens with Western investors is that the first place they run from are frontier markets. Now, that may not be a rational thing, but it's a it's kind of a behavioral thing. So if you are in Pakistan, if you are in Egypt, if you are in Turkey, uh, I think that whether or not this is a reflection of their particular economies, I think there will be some capital flight, and I think we're already seeing some capital flight from the uh, emerging and frontier markets. That's one. Secondly, 
I'm, I'm amused by this story of 1973. I remember being in university after the oil shocks and we were being taught from textbooks that were from before the oil shocks. And we would raise our hand and then we say, but what you're talking about in this textbook doesn't make sense given the oil shock. And he says, we know, we don't know, we don't know how to teach this any other way. And so we just have to use the oil shocks as an externality. In other words, even intellectually, it's going to take some time. Uh, Professor Ahmed talked about the, the, um, uh, in, the, the damage, the macro damage that will happen. There's an intellectual macro damage that's going to happen too. People are gonna be changing their minds about economics more slowly, in my opinion, than the events. Indeed, so new, new, new books would be written. Um, we need to change our framework of looking at economic policy. Um, I have one question for each of you, and then we will open up uh, for questions from audience. As always, audience, if you want to ask questions, please write it on chat, and I'll read it uh, to Ambassador Mantel and Dr. Salman. Um, first question to you, Dr. Salman. Um, so you said that this is a great economic shock. Um, uh, so it almost like reminds us of the other shock not too long ago of COVID and you know, the 2008 economic shock. In both of those cases, the, U the government, the US, the central banks uh, stepped in by pumping in a lot of money, liquidity in the market, which supported the economies. Do you see another round of QE? And will that be the only way out of this economic recession, the risk which you highlighted? So the problem with the stagflation shock is that inflation is well above central bank targets. So when we had those previous shocks, inflation was the casualty. So this was a deflation risk. So it was easier for central banks to justify it beyond the financial stability concerns they, uh, they, they shared at the time. Um, so interestingly, Russia, if you agree with our assessment, is not a fine, systemically important country. So th the financial stability concerns should not be that strong. Uh, so it goes back to the macro demand cycle management. Uh, please remember that inflation going into this shock was 7% plus because of COVID and other things. Uh, just to scare you a little bit, in 73, a month before the, car, uh, the embargo, inflation was 7.2%. So, so there are some ASE similarities in terms of where we are in the cycle. In the, in the inflation. So when I saw that number, I said, look, okay, <laughs> I mean, history does rhyme, but this is like sounding like exactly the same. Um, so, so we were already in that environment where stagflation because of what the cold shock played out was becoming a higher probability and then the central banks were starting to, 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 uh, to tackle it. Um, so I think this is gonna become even more tougher for central banks to navigate because this is not a deflationary shock, it's an inflationary shock. Uh, so, however, we have to differentiate from the key central banks. Uh, we think ECB will probably be more cautious and dovish, which has already started, um, because the recession risk in Europe is higher, and they know that. Uh, I think for US, this is a price shock, not a volume shock. I, US is uh, is energy independent, really. Uh, so they are not going to get any disruption uh, from uh, from this uh, this issue under under any scenario. Uh, so, so it's more about paying a higher price for those commodities which are in shortage. So it's more stagflationary for them. So we think Fed will continue to hike, but we don't think they will be able to hike in a gung ho manner like they were starting to talk about. Uh, so it's a bit more cautious on the tightening cycle. But ECB may have to think about uh, a targeted uh, QE. So, you know, um, like VEP, <laughs> war emergency event, <laughs> you know, purchase program, uh, in the sense like, especially if the industrial sector has to be brought offline. So we do think that targeted uh, QE and fiscal policy will be needed uh, to support uh, 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 support those companies. Very similar to what happened during COVID when you, you had to keep the companies alive whilst that disruption was in place. So COVID playbook is an interesting one in that regard. Uh, but uh, but I think overall, this is a stagflation shock. So it will be difficult um, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, 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 for central banks to navigate. Another point I would mention of the 70s playbook is that uh, the key central banks at that time did not fight inflation. They said that this was a supply shock, one-off level shift. 
you've heard that story, I'm sure, many times. Uh, who tackled the inflation shock? It was Walker who tackled the inflation shock a few years later because that oil price driven shock became embedded and then we started shaping inflation expectations. Then ultimately Walker came in, created a recession to bring inflation down, which every EM country is aware of how to do it. Uh, so, 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 so Fed's response during this supply shock will be important. If they do very aggressively hawkish things and recession risk in the US also increase. But if they don't, then we do run the risk of 70 style inflation bedding in. And then at some point in the future, Fed becoming too hawkish and bringing a recession to bring uh, that stuff. We're not there yet. Inflation expectations are still quite well, well anchored. Uh, and we do have some ind fairly independent central banks. Uh, who have a very good history of uh, controlling inflation. So that's obviously a different starting point, but that's something more from a two year, three year perspective, we'll have to think about uh, as, as this, uh, the unintended consequences of, you know, uh, of war, uh, which, uh, you know, the ripple effect of the butterfly theory, basically. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for that. And Ambassador Manta, question for you. And I suppose this is this is a difficult question in the sense that, you know, people in Pakistan are scared of the answer, potential answer for this question. But what do you think will happen um, to countries who decide to trade with Russia at this time? So I won't give the example of Pakistan because it's a difficult example to digest. But let's say if India, um, which as you said, is on the same side as Pakistan, decides that, hey, oil prices are going high, Russian can give us oil and Russian can give us wheat. So what do you, how would the US treat let's say India, if India were to now start trading with Russia? Um, I, I don't want to be too, too hawkish about this. I think that uh, there will be, uh, there, there won't be revenge. I don't think there will be a feeling that the America wants to punish people who are nice to Russia. I mean, I may be very, very wrong and it depends on how long the war goes on and how many atrocities there are and how outraged people get. But the way it is now, I believe that the way the Americans look at this and believe I'm not in the US government, I'm not even talking to you from America. But I think at this point, they understand that countries like India, countries like Pakistan are simply hedging their bets because they are afraid of what happens. They are going to see what happens next. So I think at this point, I could be wrong, but at this point, I don't see anyone saying, keeping score and saying, uh, we will punish you for being on their side against our side. I think you have the opposite problem. I think Pakistan has the opposite problem that America doesn't care. Now, in my personal opinion, I think that's an enormous mistake by my country. But I think what happens is the Americans have decided it was just too difficult dealing with Pakistan through the Afghan wars, through all the difficult time. And they say, let Pakistan go where Pakistan wants to go. We have other things we have to do. We have to deal with Russia. We have to deal with China, et cetera. So I think America is doing something else, which is ignoring Pakistan. And I think that's, I think that's, um, that's not making uh, Mr. Imran Khan very happy. But I think that's what's, that's what's happening. That could change. And at the end of the day, Americans will look to someone like Imran Khan and say, is this guy fundamentally anti-American? Can we work with this guy or not? I don't think they've come to that point yet at all. Thank you for that. That's much more optimistic than I, 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 my, my fears, which, 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 which existed. Because I suppose a lot of people in, as in the fear is because of what happened with Iran, right? Like in Iran, you cannot deal with Iran, even if you want to, and even if you are, if they are giving you, you know, cheaper oil, etc. But you don't think that Russia would be like Iran for, for, for trading for? Other no, I mean, once again, the, the idea of if. If Pakistan were to say, we are going to use our nuclear weapons to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, right? That would be a red line for the Americans. And all of a sudden you would become like Iran. But I don't hear any Pakistani government talking that way. I don't see Pakistani soldiers fighting with Hezbollah. I don't see Pakistani soldiers fighting in Syria. So in other words, a lot of the behavior that makes Iran an international pariah Pakistan doesn't do that. And I'm glad. <laughs> that I, I meant more Russia becoming like Iran, so that like anybody yeah. would trade oh, it, with Russia. So, so. No, no. Okay. If Pakistan really decides to support Russia and say, we're on Russia's side, we're going to support you, we're going to do these kinds of things, eventually that will not win friends in Washington. 
if this war continues. So I think, I think so far what Imran Khan announced and his, his people announced after the visit to Moscow was very much along the lines of building ties that are mainly economic and talking about, you know, you look, you know, the Pakistani UN ambassador said there's four things he cares about. The four, self-determination of peoples, the non-use or threat of force, sovereignty and territorial integrity of states, and the peaceful settlement of disputes. All four of these things are things that Russia has violated. So the Pakistanis are still not acting like they are big friends of this war, because I don't think they are. Oh, certainly, um, and I'm glad they're not. Um, so we are open for questions, and um, I, I, we have had some questions, so I'll start reading them. Um, so the first question, and there are a couple of them, the first is for Dr. Salman. He's asking, how do you view OPEC's role changing with Russia's role substantially diminished in light of sanctions? Moon, I'll read for the question for Ambassador Manta. So OPEC, uh, obviously Russia joined OPEC uh, as OPEC Plus a few years ago. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see, obviously the geopolitical angle is now there and the divergence of uh, interests and self-interest has to be taken into account. It's a trickier one because a lot of OPEC countries are not European countries, as we know. Or, 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 or the West. So that's something I think we have to watch in, in the coming days. What I, we can mention is on the reality so far we have seen, so the OPEC uh, production increase was 400,000 barrels per day, nothing significant, uh, which would change the dynamics of the oil market. Uh, just to give you a sense of the numbers, Russia exports around 7 million barrels uh, of oil. Um, uh, so they produce around 10 to 11 million, they ex export around 7 million. Uh, around 25 to 30% of that goes right now to China and India and some other Asian countries. The rest is to the developed world. So effectively, you're talking about a 5, five million barrel in extreme case disruption. Um, so that's, that's four times Iran disruption, just to put things into perspective. Uh, and then uh, the other point is then, what does OPEC do? So OPEC, even if, let's, uh, unfortunately, I am not the right person to ask about the willingness of countries to come together. <laughs> but I can tell you in different scenarios, what are the numbers look like? So even if we assume, we assume that there's willingness to, uh, to replace uh, the entire Russia disruption, which is around 5 million. So taking out China and India and others, uh, OPEC only has two and a half million spare capacity uh, per day, of, uh, two, two and a half million barrel per day. So that only takes out, you know, uh, less than half of Russia. If Iran deal comes through, we, we get another 1 million, 1.5, depending on you speak to. The SPR release has been 2 million per day on a 30 day basis. So that's one month. Total SPR reserve, uh, release reserves are 600 million. So it also depends on the duration of the disruption. Uh, but the key message I want to give you is that Russia is a beast in this in this export markets. And, and it will also depend on the, uh, the duration of disruption we're talking about, not just in the near term. And that's why the risk premium in oil prices are going up. As people do more and more of this math, they realize that potentially that this is, uh, uh, this can be a very significant problem if, if it, obviously actual, actualizes in the, uh, in the first term, in the first uh, uh, moment. So, so that's something to, to, to consider, but in terms of the geopolitical issue and how does that affect the, uh, the, uh, the OPEC itself, we'll have to look at what OPEC releases are. So, so far the 400K is a normal release. It's not in something extraordinary uh, which has happened. Uh, and even if uh, they go in and want to replace Russia, it's not possible with their excess uh, capacity. So Dr. Salman, in December at our, at our conference in Karachi, you, 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 you predicted oil prices going above $100, which they did. Um, so you think now it's much more than that, that it means. Actually, I predicted $150. Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, so uh, I think 150 has to be our base case uh, in terms of a proper spike. Um, just to be, uh, to be, um, to be uh, again using the 73 embargo example in today's price terms uh, we move from around 55 dollars to 180 dollars 
per barrel in today's 2022 price terms. Um, so that was uh, tripling of oil prices. Uh, so, and, and this time around, we are moving from, I would say $75 was the base case, uh, baseline before this thing became important. So 75 to 80, depending on which day you pick it up. I mean, it's up to you now. Uh, $5 is not gonna make a difference. But so, so you're starting, let's say from 80, uh, uh, dollars per barrel, uh, we've already moved forty dollars almost, uh, so thirty-six dollars uh, almost. Um, so, uh, so I think if we use the 70, 73 template, then you know this this thing this thing can go past one hundred and fifty quite quite significantly. But then there's also a question of whether this is a spike, whether how does it stay there because it can create a recession. Uh, you know, then there's demand destruction. So that's that's how commodity commodity interplay is because commodity is not an asset in a, in, in the traditional uh, traditional sense sure so uh, higher oil prices lead to lower oil prices in the future yes a spike i would say leads to a lower oil price in the future because the system comes offline you know okay. and moving to the next question to dr master manta he's asking how far does the do the Biden administration will the Biden administration go in terms of sanctioning Russia? Is there a concern that too many abrupt sanctions straight away potentially risk revealing the sanction card to Putin way too early? That means that it will leave potentially very little room to further punish him for his misadventure. And how does the U.S. react if the nuclear threat is put on the table? Yeah, I mean, sanctions are are very blunt instruments, you know, and they're, they're not fine-tuned things where you give a sanction expecting a response and then you pull away a sanction. Um, these sanctions were held off. Many people were saying if we had had sanctions, perhaps he wouldn't have gone in the first place. Other people said you have to give him a chance to do the right thing before you do sanctions so that the kind of fine tuning of sanctions is not very often done by political leadership. And so what we're seeing, in my opinion, is we're seeing people who held back on sanctions now throwing the entire sanction at, at, at Russia. And yes, they can always find new ways. Don't forget, once you do sanctions, the real trick is going to be the implementation of sanctions. You can say a lot of things, but now you have the French and the Germans taking away yachts from you know, billionaires in their port. You, you don't know how it's going to be implemented. So I guess I duck the question a little bit about sanctions because I, I don't think sanctions are a very coherent thing. They're just I think they've been hit hard. I think they may think the Americans and the Western Europeans may think of other kinds of sanctions. They may press the Japanese and the Koreans and the Australians to do deeper sanctions. But I, I don't think it's done in quite the reasonable way that people might expect. On this nuclear question, um, uh, a lot of people are scared. I mean, there's that question is, is you know, Putin a madman, would he blow us all up? No one knows. But the Russians have raised their nuclear uh, preparedness on a scale of one to four. They've raised it to two. That is to say, their, new, their weapons are not poised to fly, right? They've raised it to one level. I think wisely, the Americans did not respond, did not comment and did not respond. And that's, that's, I think so far the way it has to be. What people are afraid of is what happens if against all odds, what if actually the Russian army begins to lose in Ukraine, which is not likely, but it's also not impossible. What, what does he do? And then you get into uncharted territory. No one really knows. One of the things that's very disturbing to people like me is that during the Cold War, uh, we had a very uh, dense network of communications between our militaries to try to avoid the mistakes of a misunderstanding. One of the things that happened over the last 20, 30 years is that that set of nuclear experts talking to one another, those dense networks of ties have kind of fallen away because people and many people were too optimistic. They thought we don't need it anymore, et cetera. So ironically, the ties between America and uh, or the nuclear states and Russia are not as close and so the biggest fear I have is the, the danger of a nuclear accident, a misunderstanding, a misrepresentation. And that's, that's, that's always been a danger, 
but now with tensions heightened, it's more of one. Thank you. Uh, the next question, um, I'll take one part of that. Um, both of you have spoken about, uh, Ambassador Munter spoke about wheat um, um, and Russia being, and Ukraine being major producers of wheat. So uh, we have spoken about oil prices, but what does the crisis do to grain prices in the long run? I'll leave it to the expert here who is an economist, but I can't imagine that the oil price of wheat goes down. <laughs> I don't know. Professor, I don't know what what happened, Dr. Ahmed. What what happens? So on 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 wheat prices themselves and the food prices, I think the shock is 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 real uh, and has already started. Um, so the question would be obviously demand destruction, which such a shock brings in. So we'll have to think about uh, uh, you know how much of, it's, it's, it is like a spike risk, and then there's a supply response which comes in. Uh, one thing I would also mention is that there are some interlinkages to be taken into account. Unfortunately, they are not very positive. So already fertilizer prices are very high because nat gas was quite expensive. Because remember, nat gas is a very key ingredient into fer producing fertilizers. So And fertilizers have a direct link with crop yields. Uh, so nat gas shocks in Europe last year in Q4, uh, not a lot of people remember that there was this extreme nat gas shock in, in Europe in Q4 of, uh, of 2021. It had already switched off uh, supply of fertilizers into the system. We were entering this year with uh, crop yields potentially lower because Africa, for example, was not able to get um, a hold of, of proper fertilizers. So there are all interlinkages there we need to think about, but, but it, that's why the interlinkages between commodities are, so is important. So it's, it's, it's quite a proper spike risk. In, 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 in these grain markets, especially because the fact that Ukraine is already off, off the grid now. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Munter, um, I'll ask a slightly off topic um, um, question, but linked to what you said. And then you mentioned that, you know, US has been kind of ignoring Pakistan. Uh, and I would say that, you know, it's, it's not that this was unexpected by the policy uh, on, uh, on Pakistani side, because they kind of feared that that would happen because that's what happened. Um, when the Afghan war, the first Afghan war ended. So how do you think a country like Pakistan should take it? Like, because you also gave the example of, you know, countries like China who are very long-term focused and, you know, they buy their time. Do, do you think that Pakistan should do similarly? Because there's also a, a, a opinion in Pakistan that Biden will, or the democratic administration will not change. So we just need to wait for Trump to come back in power and have a better relationship when that happens. How do you think, what should Pakistan do? Well, I mean, as, as, a, as, a, as a true friend of Pakistan, uh, I, I gave a talk at, at, a, at a group called the Margala Dialogues, which took place last year, which is in a situation where you're not being looked at as part of the Afghanistan problem, which during my time as a diplomat and you know, in many years, people argued and they used the metaphor that we looked at Pakistan through the lens of Afghanistan, and this was wrong. And I, and I agree that I think that was wrong. We're not doing that anymore. Okay, so yes, we're not making that mistake, but we're, we're not replacing it with a new way of looking at, Afghan, at Pakistan. What then did Pakistan do in the situation? This to me is an enormous opportunity for Pakistan, not to worry about Russia, not to worry about China, not to worry about America, but to worry about Pakistan. That is to say, if you think about the amount of reform that's necessary in Pakistan to make this country with 200 million people and enormous capacity to make it a vibrant country, you need domestic reform. And I'll be blunt, you know, one of the domestic reforms that I've always thought is important is you need enormous tax reform. You have a parliament full of people who are dependent on the low value added industries, the agriculture, the textiles, and they're keeping you in the third world because the people in your parliament in Pakistan are interested in keeping you in the third world. That's what makes them rich. That's why these big families in Punjab and Sindh have lots of money and sell towels to the United States. But if you really wanted to develop your high-tech industry and your, you have great universities and you have smart young people, the reforms that need to take place are to break the power of the people who want to keep you in the dark ages and to allow progressive people in your country, especially the business community, to be a constituency. You know, now all you have is influence politics. You don't have constituencies. You don't have chambers of commerce who advise people. 
No one's listening to them. People are listening to the military or they're listening to the landowners. So I could go on and on, but these are just an ideas. If Pakistan wants to be a powerful country, it's not going to get it by loving China, Russia, or America. It's going to be a great country because it reforms itself and unlocks all of the possibility that people in Pakistan have, in my opinion. Thank you so much. That was a very, very good advice. As a, and as you said, as a friend of Pakistan, which you indeed are, um, we have time to squeeze one last question. And that question is, um, I'm just rephrasing that question that, um, do you think that um, there's a chance of a settlement between Russia and Ukraine? And if such a settlement would happen, uh, would we go back to uh, how things were before Thursday? It's, it's too opaque. At this point, there's nothing on the table that I can see. Uh, it's good news that they still talk, but uh, it is not good news that there's no credible alternative, no credible way of imagining a ceasefire at this point. So I hate to be very pessimistic, but I don't see it. I don't see the possibility of this. And the more destruction that takes place, the less likely that you can go back to the way things are. Thank you so much for your time, Ambassador Mantra, Dr. Salman. And um, what I learned, and like it's my summary, not I'm not attributing because I might make, make a mistake in that, that this is a long-term issue and and, and um, there is uncertainty about it. Um, and it is leading to structural changes and different things. So have has in, and perhaps all of us need to and try to understand that. And the example which you gave in terms of the 1973 all shock, shock and how it took people time to adjust to that intellectual change. I think all of us have not spent that time to, or need that time to understand what truly has happened and how the global economy will react to it. And uh, I do hope that, you know, one thing that I've learned in my career in the last 17 years that, you know, we have seen many, many shocks, you know, and the 2008 crisis and COVID shock and, you know, uh, the tech bubble shock, that uh, the optimists have won. They've always made more money than the pessimists. So with that note that, you know, um, uh, whatever doesn't kill us makes us strong, that hope, hopefully we'll come out stronger from this. Thank you for your time. Uh, it was great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.